The words that Christ put into the mouth of Abraham speaking from heaven. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. What a condemnation of unbelieving mankind to whom graciously God has revealed both his person in creation, his word and what he desires of mankind through the law and through the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both his perfect life, fulfilling the law and the prophets and their promises, but also rising from the dead. What more does man need by which he will understand where life is and where his best life is that is yet to come? But look at mankind. We live as if our best life is now. The pursuit of ambition and pleasure is all that there is. Bringing glory to ourselves enjoying the fruits of our hands, that is what it is about, pleasing our bodily appetites and rejecting a holy God who is the giver of all good things. We know that God condemns such an attitude. But do you think that this is all that there is? Or rather, do you live your daily lives as if this is all there is? You give some moment's thought to eternity and heaven and pleasing God. But that's perhaps just secondary or even further down the list of your daily lives lives and concerns. And you're more caught up with the same attitudes and appetites of the world around you. Getting and spending. The day of the Lord will come. Are you ready? That shrewd steward that the master commended in Jesus' parable. He was commended because he knew the day of reckoning was at hand and he was preparing for that day of reckoning. We are sons of the light. We have the revelation of the word of God. We have the law and the prophets. We have one who has come back from the dead and yet men say, It's all a mystery. Nobody's come back to tell us. So let us live with that mystery in a little box put away from our thinking and just enjoy eating and drinking for tomorrow we may die. The heart of this parable is a man who thought just like that. But firstly, Christ engaged with those who were the stewards of the law and the prophets for Israel. First, we look at these verses, 14 to 18. God knows your heart. He knows our heart also by the fruits of our actions because it was seen there in in verse 13. We cannot serve two masters. And as we were thinking last Lord's Day that where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Is it with earthly prestige and power and politics? Or is it with pleasing God and with the blessings of the new creation? How is it that you measure yourself? Is it under God or is it to your fellow man? Do you measure yourself under God by your works? How good a person you are? Well, we have sung from God's word that the wind blows over that place where your works once stood. Beautiful for the moment. Tomorrow, just as someone will clear your house after your death, all the things that you took joy in are cast aside or even thrown into the fire. Or are you measured by grace? That you have been in receipt of the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ? And humbly you understand your position before God. And that is engaged with the promise that as sons we inherit. The law and the prophets, as Christ sets out, were preached until John. These Pharisees were stewards of the law and the prophets, telling us what God requires of us, who he is. The prophets also telling us what will take place and also applying the word of God to their day. But now in the 
new dispensation, this period where Christ, the Son of God, is among them. The message, in a sense, hasn't changed. There is still the gospel of grace that was preached in the Old Testament. Repent and believe. But here, the very king of the kingdom of God has come, preaching this message of the gospel. Good news to mankind. But man still finds grace an insult to their own pride. I can decide my works that are pleasing to God. I can design my own way to him. And we hear regularly people saying blasphemously that they have some agreement, some personal covenant with a man upstairs, as they often say. How dare they say that there's some better way than the way of Christ? They wish to earn their salvation. Will they then be in full intent of being judged by their own works with all their feelings and weaknesses and pride? Do they not wish to receive all those things that are promised to us in Christ? The grace of what has already been purchased. There is a day of accounting for the stewards of the gospel. How shrewd these Pharisees were. They were stewards of the law but they were not preparing to meet God. Just placing a heavier burden on the yoke on the shoulders of the Israelites, compounding their problems with law-keeping with more man-made laws which were rejected. Luke makes a very interesting comment, a written word underneath about the Pharisees, and it's a great condemnation. They were lovers of money. He might have said they were lovers of the law. And that may lead to to other thinkings. Well, they just got too involved in it or or took it too seriously. Or they were lovers of tradition or lovers of culture or lovers of their position in society. But he gets to the heart of the matter. They were lovers of money. Meaning that they were lovers of the material blessings that were around them. They justified themselves by their wealth and their power and their influence. Meanwhile, not lifting a finger to help the honest believer who was seeking to please God. They were stewards of the scripture and the word of God, but did nothing to assist any others. These things that were defined by this very statement showed that their life and their attitude was an abomination to God because he knows the heart. These were not servants of God, as he said back in verse 13. They were despising God because they loved money. Instead of using the money that they had on righteous mammon, as Christ had said, for the glory of God, to win people to the kingdom by acts of kindness and and generosity. And such a picture is given in the account of the rich man and Lazarus. They stood daily in the presence of God among the covenant people of God. And so often they were in the temple courts, believing themselves justified by position and law-keeping. But what does Christ say there? The crowds were pressing past them into the kingdom. What a startling thing to say. There they were consumed by by who they were and their position there in society. But in verse 16, the crowds of people, people that you oppress, the people that you denounce as being worthless and ungodly, they are entering into the kingdom with joy and thanksgiving. And you are not. The Lord Jesus addressed through the matter of the law in the minds and thinking of these Pharisees. Looking there at verse 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle, one little stroke of the law to fail. How people seek to change the law of God to their own purposes. Change a letter, change a phrase, change a word, and suddenly you can do anything that you choose. Anything then is licensed for the person to do because Somehow it has been dismissed by God. 
We are too aware of how society changes the word of God to suit its own ends and its own ethics and its own pursuit of sinful liberties as they perceive them. Do we seek to be justified by the law? Of course not. But we are justified by Christ's perfect keeping of the law. That is the record that is upon our life. And not one stroke of the law has been done away with by Christ Jesus. And the law stands from creation to the end of time. The law is a sign of God's holiness and man's sinfulness. Those without Christ, as Paul writes to those who are seeking to make all the Gentiles Jews before they become Christians, are saying, are you wanting again to be judged under all the law of the Old Testament? Is that how you want to measure up to God? Or are you seeking grace? The law is a sign of man's sinfulness, of course. But Christian, we do not want the law to pass away. Well, that seems a strange thing to say, but think about it. It is the righteousness of Christ His perfect obedience that clothes you in the Father's presence. He obeyed the Lord, the law of the Lord perfectly, so that we are not judged by our poor and our disobedient commandment keeping. Here surely is the understanding of grace in the face of the law that if the law was extinguished, if its power was extinguished by the cross over all of mankind and mankind was no longer being judged by the law, then what was the cross for? Then everyone could be justified without grace. And then that righteousness that we receive in Christ would be of little merit. Historical value, but not of any value today. The law stands And we rejoice it stands because it is in Christ's perfect record of law keeping that makes us acceptable before God for eternity and we will never fall from grace. But there Christ highlights this in verse 18. Seems a strange little verse here that Luke is inserted into the passage. Is this something that he's forgotten about and he just pops it in here just to remind us of of some teaching about Scripture? No, these are the words of Christ highlighting the law and speaking to the Pharisees. Because what had happened in the day of Christ was that the Pharisees had changed the law of marriage and divorce to justify the circumstances. That men could divorce their wives over something petty like their cooking or, or some other dress or some, uh, some other behavior and marry someone else. So Christ was restating the law of God to the Pharisees in the hearing of everybody. So they knew the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who were saying the law cannot change but who had changed the law themselves to suit their circumstances. They were not the stewards of the law. They were twisting the law. They were corrupting the law to suit their position in the world, their influence that they were seeking from others, and the changes that they were in society. But the law of God still stands, and they will be judged by the law and the prophets. God knows our heart who it is that we serve. But secondly, as we come on to this account of the the rich man and Lazarus. God knows the repentant heart. There is debate, obviously, as we consider this passage. Uh, We understand it to be a parable in a sense, but it's not that the reality of the afterlife is figurative here. These obviously are real situations, just as any other parable was a picture taken from life. So this is a picture taken from life and the next life. So why would we think of it in that sense any different? Even there was not an individual named Lazarus or a particular rich man in actual historic event, but they're inserted into this account of of real life and real death. 
But what is important is, is that God knows the heart of the individual. Death is that moment when the wind passes over our works and our lives, and we're gone from this world. And how quickly we are forgotten. And all that we treasure is cast into the fire. So what is it that lasts? Have we used the grace of God? Have we used the law and the prophets? Have we understood the presentation to us of Christ and the work of salvation? Have we believed? That is how God measures us by grace and not by our works. Two figures then are taken from life that they would have been very familiar with in the days of Christ and also in our own days. The rich man in his mansion, enjoying the fruits, the fine clothing, the, the parties, and many Pharisees at those parties, I'm sure. And the familiar scene of the poor man at the gate begging for his bread. Perhaps he is in some sense disabled or in unable to work in some means. But the story is told for the great contrast that it gives. One man is blessed in this life with much material, gold and and bigger barns and fine clothes and many friends, but does not have faith in the grace of God. The other is one who is not blessed with material things, and is in the utter position of, a, of poverty, but is blessed with faith. God knows the heart, and God knows the repentant heart. Barns and bigger barns was the example of this rich man. Harvests that were brought in just like the other parable of the rich man who died the night of the ingathering. But no thanksgiving and no humility. No shrewdness with what God had given this rich man against the day of the Lord. He hadn't been wise. He hadn't thinking how he could distribute his wealth to assist others while enjoying the fruits of his labors with thanksgiving. And this other man, despised and rejected by many men, is covered in sores and more sores. And his friends seeking to help him brought him to beg there at the gate of the rich man, just to be the object of the rich man's charity, from whom he didn't receive even the crumbs from the feasting table. Now Christ is not saying that there is merit spiritually in poverty, nor merit in wealth. Both have their difficulties. Both can be just as greedy and materialistic as each other. But there are, of course, particular snares from wealth. But there is merit in faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And faith is a gift. Lazarus on his death, as in life, rested in the promise given to Abraham of a saviour. They're confirming to him the promises that one would come in whom Abraham saw his day and delighted. There he rested in the picture that is given in Abraham's bosom. He was in the bosom of the fulfillment of these promises in which he had struggled in the physical flesh, but now enjoyed in the heavenly flesh, in the, in the heavenly body. These promises were true. They gave him comfort. He was rejoicing. And there is no picture that while Abraham was able to communicate in a special way with a rich man, that this poor man Lazarus knew nothing but bliss. That was his joy. All the sorrows were left behind along with his body of sores and pain. The rich man, what did he have? Ringing in his mind right through eternity in hell was the word of the law and the prophets. Or was the example of this poor man at his gate to whom he never showed a crumb of mercy, resting upon his wealth and power that was now distributed to his brothers. The people were feasting at his his funeral meal and the many things that were counted worthless and cast into the fire. Lazarus was judged by the covenant of grace, 
and he was found in the place of blessing. The rich man was judged by the covenant of works, do and live, but had not done and had died in suffering the second death. God knows the heart. God knows the humble and repentant heart. And God saw Lazarus as a steward of the law and the prophets. Thirdly, God sees the heart of pride as we think here of the conversation of the rich man with Abraham across a gulf. There was no relief that could return from heaven. And perhaps part of the the torment is that the rich man was able to see all that he had lost, all that he had despised, all that he had set aside for the earthly pleasures that were now gone. These are terrifying scenes from beyond this world and beyond this life. This is a real scene. Even the two characters may have been fictional, but this is a real scene of the division. A division that reflects in the next life. A division that is here in this life. Having received the law and prophets, having received the preaching of the kingdom, what do we do with it? As the veil of death is drawn back for our challenge and for our encouragement, We see the total contrast. We saw the contrast in life. But now there is the contrast of the conscious bliss of this poor man next to the conscious conscious torment of the rich man. The suffering that is forgotten of the man who was poor here in his health and in material wealth to the suffering that was only beginning for the rich man ever to contemplate the lost opportunity responding to grace. Lazarus, in his own humble way, was a steward of the law and the prophets, unable to achieve much in the material world, but he embraced the grace of God in Abraham's covenant. The rich man could not even earn a drop of water to cool his sorrow. He wasn't thinking about those things he'd left behind. He wasn't thinking about money to pay. He knew the reality of the situation that he was in. And how verse 13 was true. He had been a servant of unrighteous mammon. It had mastered him. And he is the one who had followed it. He had worshipped it. And in that he had despised the true and the living God. He had not any means to find comfort. And the regret of rejecting all that had been set before him there would ever burn deeply into his conscience. The last plea, not that there was any merit in his thoughts, but his last plea was for those who were left behind. But Abraham says in this account, They had it all. They had everything that they needed to respond. They had the law and the prophets. They had the words of Moses. They had the promise of the Messiah. They had through Moses the principle of the sacrifice set up. The atonement, the picture of the temple that was there, the picture of Christ. They had the history of the world. They had all these things, and that not only had been preached until John, but now there was the extra blessing of the kingdom of God. And there standing among them was the king. The first citizen of this kingdom, and he is the one who would die and be raised from the dead. You man in his sinfulness will not even believe. They will not even believe should Christ be raised from the dead. What a moment of condemnation to those who were hardened in heart. The Pharisees who knew it all. Pharisees who loved money, but yet around whom the crowds were pressing into the kingdom, receiving grace, and they would be in the bosom of Abraham and that promise made to him. But they were standing there like those scenes 
of a fixed body of people and the blur of people around them rushing past them. They were steadfast in their unbelief. Well, they would be eternally in that place of torment. Where is your best life? Do you think it's just now? Do you ever give a thought to the life hereafter? Do you ever give a thought to your duty and responsibility considering the message of Scripture and the person of Christ? If you are in Christ Jesus, your best life has only just begun. Be good stewards of the grace of God. Amen.